Uh, my name is David, and I'm one of the co-curators here. Uh, my other co-curator is Chris, down over here by the technical <laughs> side of everything. Um, and we are a student-run organization through UC Davis, and this is one of our salons. It is a smaller event that we would like to have more frequently. So if you do enjoy this, we are having another one in January. Um, as part of the TED organization, we are here for the perpetuation of great ideas. Now, I would like to go ahead and introduce our MC for th this morning, um, Tanya, and she will be going and introducing all of our rest of our speakers and providing an explanation for our theme, Roots of Inspiration. You all look so lovely today. Thank you all for coming out. How are you all doing today? Oh my goodness! Can we get a nice round of applause for Chris and David and all the wonderful volunteers at TEDx UC Davis? They have been putting in so much work. Oh my goodness! There's even a, this is the best audience that I have encountered this entire week. Thank you all so much. So today, as you can see on our program, our theme for this TEDx UC Davis salon is Roots of Inspiration. So what I encourage you to think about is what differs pure inspiration from a root of inspiration. And the way that I see it is a root of inspiration is that small idea, you know, inspiration is really big and you see it everywhere. And a root is a little bit smaller and it's young and you have to take care of it and you have to make sure that it grows and you really have to spend a lot of time with it. So I encourage you to think about not only what directly inspires you, but some things that you might have to work a little bit harder on to become inspiration. And as you listen to our speakers and our performers, I'd like you to also see what inspires them and how it might connect to what also inspires you. I think we have a lot more in common with our inspirations than we may realize. So our first speaker that we have for tonight is Professor Stephen Wheeler, who is deeply involved with many departments at UC Davis and other universities as well, which you can see from his bio. And one thing that he asked me to mention, which I'm also very interested in, is there is a brand new major at UC Davis, which is the Sustainable Environmental Design major, and he happens to be the faculty advisor for it. So you can always speak to him if you're interested. But for now, instead of speaking to Professor Professor Wheeler. We are going to listen to him speak. So please join me in welcoming Professor Wheeler up to the stage. Okay, thank you all very much. I am a faculty member in the Department of Human Ecology at UC Davis, and I have the honor to be the kickoff speaker today. I'm going to do a fairly big picture talk, but it is going to lead into the many other talks and performances which have more detailed um, examples of roots, of sustainable, of inspiration. And I see I already moved on to the next, next slide. I am going to talk about sustainable cities, which is a theme I have worked with for about 20 years. Now, I will be the first to admit that our current cities, towns, suburbs, and exurbs are far from sustainable. We have a lot of problems out there. We have a lot of traffic congestion. We have pollution. We have lack of affordability. We have inequity. We have lots of places that are just plain boring, where there's no life going on where we don't feel inspired, right? Some of you grew up in those places. Some of you maybe live in those places. But where there is crisis, there is opportunity. We have opportunities everywhere, and I'm going to mainly focus on those today. And there is lots of inspiring work out there. There are lots of roots shooting up, or shooting down, and sprouts shooting up. Let's try that metaphor. How's that? Okay, people always ask me when I hope this clicker works. Okay, technical support, please help. Okay, which way do I click? Okay, which one was that? Okay, I hope I remember. Okay, people always ask me what is sustainability? Isn't that a very vague term? Does it really mean anything? Hmm. And my response is it does mean some things that are fairly different from the ways that 
the world worked in the 20th century and the ways that we developed our cities and towns. It means three things mainly, taking a long-term approach. That seems common sense, right? But let's face it, we have many incentives for short-term thinking in our society. If we're a politician, we think about the next election. If we're a corporation, we think about the next quarterly report. And many of us are simply trying to survive day to day, week to week, quarter to quarter. So practicing long-term or seventh generation thinking, if you prefer, is one aspect of sustainability work. Another is thinking holistically or ecologically. This has many different pieces to it, but they're all similar. One is thinking across different goals thinking about environment, environmental protection or restoration at the same time as economic prosperity and social justice or equity, the three E's. Another is thinking across scales of work, thinking in terms of what we can do at a household level, at the individual level, at the neighborhood level, at the city level, at the regional level or the watershed level at the state level, the national level, and the global level. That's a lot of levels, isn't it? We had a bumper sticker in the 70s. Think globally, act locally. Very good, okay? But that was the beginning, one of the beginnings of this type of thinking. But really, there are more scales. We need to think at many different scales and see how they interrelate. And we need to act at whatever scales we can. We need to also work across professions, across disciplines, and across communities. And lastly, we need to be actively involved. We need to be creative and proactive and inspirational. In the 20th century, again, we had an ideal of the professional as an objective expert who stands apart from problems and delivers data to decision makers. Well, nobody really stands apart. We are all in it together and all of us can be proactive in framing alternatives. Okay, let's talk about a few specific challenges we have with our cities and towns, just to provide a little more background. This is the environment a lot of people experience every day. Very dominated by a particular technology, the motor vehicle, and it's not just the roads that have changed, but the entire landscape around the roads has been designed to accommodate this technology at the expense of many other human needs. This is the case not just in North America, but increasingly the rest of the world as well. Latin America, for example. And even the developing world, like China, which is in the middle of the most rapid transition to motor motorization that the world has ever seen. It is also in the middle of some of the worst air pollution the world has ever seen. And there's a relation between the two. So this is one set of problems. And traditionally, we tried to address this problem through technology, right? Technology is going to solve our problems. Well, it doesn't. We can't just widen roads forever because we simply get more cars and more driving. So this is one set of problems. We also, with our cities and towns have particular patterns of land use that are not particularly productive. We have what is known as suburban sprawl. And we have to be precise about these things. Suburban sprawl is often low density, but not always. It is disconnected. The road systems do not connect. You cannot get from here to there without a car. It is single use. You have all the houses over here, all the jobs over there, all the shopping over there, schools over here, and you have to drive. And it often leapfrogs across the countryside in a disconnected fashion as we see here. This is not just, there are many forms of this around the world. This is Southern California. This is higher density, but it still has those same characteristics. Single use neighborhoods, non-connected pods of development and motor vehicle dependency. And then we have countries like China that are developing high rise forms of sprawl, very different, but Still some of the same characteristics. Single use, poor connections, and increasingly dependent on motor vehicles. So this is one of our current patterns we need to think about. We also have very big houses and very big cars. We have lots of consumption. Whole sets of problems there. We have use of particular, water, uh, particular resources, such as water. 
very important in the West, in this state. And this is Las Vegas, pumping water left out, uh, left in the ground from the last glacier. That is disappearing fast. Also pumping water out of the Colorado River, which is disappearing fast. We have particular patterns of relation to the natural environment. We have bulldozed large pieces of land. We have put the waterways into pipes or culverts. We have removed habitat. We have patterns of economic development that are very big scale and global. Now, yes, we all like to get cheap stuff sometimes, and we all like to drive and things like that, but there's a limit, and the balance is a bit out of line, and there are many costs. Walmart may have cheap stuff, but it also pays cheap wages that people cannot live on, and it drives the traditional businesses out of downtowns. And it results in a placeless, placelessness, a geography of nowhere, as one person has called it. Every place looks the same. We lose culture, tradition, connection to the places we live. We also become unhealthy often. Uh, this is spreading worldwide as well. We eat foods that do not work for us. And we live in places that are inequitable. This is a map of the tax base of different jurisdictions in the Chicago area. Some of them have way more money than others for local schools, services, roads, other types of things. Okay, and the ultimate sustainability problem, climate change. I'm not going to go into this, but we need to deal with it. And cities and towns are one of the places that we can do that. Okay, this, has, this is kind of tough stuff, right? Not terribly inspirational, but along with this, we have a lot of opportunities, and I'm gonna spend the rest of my time on these. And we have a lot of great stuff going on locally. At the national level, at big scales currently, it's grim. We don't have a very functional politics. Increasingly, we cannot even get to the point where we can plan for sustainability. But locally, many, many cities and towns, many individual people are pioneering different ways of living and building towns. This used to be a double-decker freeway in San Francisco, the central artery, or the central freeway. It was damaged in the Loma Prieta quake. People saw an opportunity. Do we need this huge gray piece of concrete in the middle of our neighborhood? Lo and behold, they took it down and designed surface level parks, playgrounds, a boulevard that helped knit the neighborhood together. My friends Elizabeth Jake and Jake there at the center had the pleasure of actually designing it. This was another double-decker freeway in the middle of Seoul, South Korea. A pioneering mayor had the vision of taking that down, restoring the waterway that used to be underneath and creating a central green corridor through the city. So greening cities in these ways, restoring previously damaged urban places is one of our great opportunities. We have a lot of what are known as brownfield sites. These are, I think I stepped on the cord. Okay, let's try this. Uh, these are contaminated pieces of land where there was industry or railroads or other types of big infrastructure. This mic is not working very well. Okay, does it work? Let's try this mic. Is this better? Okay. I have moved on. Let's see. Let's go back to, this was a shipyard, a huge a ship basin in Vancouver, British Columbia, redeveloped into an entire string of neighborhoods, paths, bikeways, parks, all around. Beautiful amenity. This is known as False Creek. We have lots of parking. Whenever I lead a walking tour of a city, when, I see, when we see a parking lot or a parking garage, we think opportunity. And the city of Portland, Oregon, took this three-story parking garage down, created a plaza, which is essentially the city's living room. People come here 24-7. There are events all the time. 
people hang out, it is the place to be. So adding civic space back in is one inspiring local type of action. Okay, all those creeks, all those waterways that are in culverts or in pipes, we can dig them out. This was a creek underground in Berkeley that I actually was involved in about 20 years ago. We got the landowner to dig it out of the pipe it was in with the assistance of a state grant and these volunteers are reconstructing a natural stream channel along the route and it is now a park. Replanting native vegetation, we have e ecologies around us that have been colonized by non-native plants, by invasive species. Digging them out, putting the native habitat back in good part of restoring the function, the ecological function of our landscapes. Lots of water systems can be rethought. Gray water within buildings, runoff from roofs, from parking lots. We can do creative things with those, or as in this case, even sewage. We don't like to think about sewage, do we? But the city of Arcata had a choice. Does it spend 27 million on a mechanical sewage treatment plant, or does it construct a wetland to handle it. It took the latter approach in the way back in the 1980s. And this, this marsh is now a wildlife refuge. It's a popular park. People are building housing around it because it's so beautiful. It is a huge amenity for that city. We, even with a simple parking lot, we can put a green swale in the middle, take the, veg take the water into the ground, infiltrate it on site, and add beauty. Bigger scales of action through urban planning. We can put a line around sprawl. The dark line that you see here is an urban growth boundary around the Portland metropolitan area. And all the little circles are visions of transit-oriented development, clustered communities that have a center and have a place and also have public transportation. We can preserve farmland next to cities as in much of Europe has done and rebuild the linkages between that farmland and local people. Farm to fork is one of the mantras these days in Sacramento as well as many other places. And Davis, we are pretty familiar with this kind of thing, but there are many forms of urban agriculture also that are being added to make this connection. We can reverse the traditional priority hierarchy of transportation. Instead of high-tech transportation, we can start with our feet and bikes and public transportation and work up from there. There's a global movement of traffic calming. City of Davis here has many traffic calming features and this is reclaiming our main form of public space for multiple uses. Also new types of public transit. This is a light rail train but there are there's a lot of creativity in this area. There's bus rapid transit, there are metro systems, there's all sorts of interesting paratransit vehicles, pedicabs, you name it, that people are experimenting with locally. Zero net energy neighborhoods. We have here in Davis the world's first zero net energy neighborhood. But eventually every house, all of the structures that we live and work in can, be, can produce more energy than they consume. And this is one of the main ways we will address climate change. Information, we can use information to change our behavior in terms of energy, in terms of lots of other dimensions. We can think about the whole metabolism of products and materials that flows through our lives at a local level. Not just recycling, but reducing our use, reusing things. We have new institutions like FreeCycle locally where people can go online and just share stuff they don't need anymore. Lots of creativity here. We have equity initiatives, even in this last election in which, let's face it, the red states, the red cities predominated in a lot of these places, minimum wage ordinances passed, raising the minimum wage in some cases from around $7 an hour to $15 an hour. That's a pretty big leap. And also we have lots of nonprofit organizations building affordable housing in different places many of them founded and run by people like UC Davis students just a few years out of school who 
are doing something good for their own community. Last but not least, we have creative, many, many creative roots of change with the arts, with music. We will see some of those today, later, but all sorts of things, neighborhoods, cities, households can do to make our world interesting, to be in fun and sustainable. They go together, involving people in their own future also through various exercises, types of public participation, maybe even including the TEDx series um, is another part of this. So all of these elements can go together to try to make our the places we live work better, work better for the future, for the long-term future, and for ourselves. And hopefully, if we are creative and strategic, we can find jobs for ourselves doing this kind of thing. We can found businesses, as I think we'll hear in a little while. We can involve the art, and we can build community. So lots of opportunities. The big scale picture is pretty difficult, but the local picture has lots of roots and shoots, and let's see what we can do to make those grow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Mueller. One thing that I'd like to draw attention to is how he closed by saying, you know, it can be really overwhelming looking at the big scale, but start small, start local, and combine that with the idea that he brought up of the things that we don't need. Do I really need to rebuild the freeway? Do we really need all these extra things that we have? And maybe the next time something that you have breaks, instead of going out to buy it and completely replacing it, think about what you can do with it or how you can do without it instead. So that's definitely something inspiring for me. Thank you. And so our next speaker that we have, Joe Gee, if you've gotten the chance to check out his bio, um, you can see he has a lot of involvement with business and leadership, but these are really you know, high stress environments and what's really inspiring to me is how balanced he seemed to be able to take that and the rest of his life. And I got the chance to chat with him a little bit beforehand um, because as you can see, he says that he likes to balance it with his passions for music and martial arts, and he is a saxophonist in a rock band and has been practicing multiple different types of martial arts while still managing to be a very accomplished member of the business and leadership world. So I would like you all to join me in welcoming Jogi to the stage. slide, right? About five years ago, on the corner of 3rd and C Street right here in Davis, a man named David Bro began standing at, the, at this corner day after day with a notebook in his hand and asking people what their concept of compassion was and would they write that down in their, would they write that down in their notebook. <clears throat> and as he was standing at this corner, he speaks of his own inspiration to do something uh, significant, to, to spend a significant amount of his time and his energy, his resources in selflessness. And I don't know if any of you uh, have met uh, met David or uh, wrote in his book, uh, have seen uh, the result of his work there, but something like 10,000 entries were put in this book, about 3,000 or so were published, were uh, put, put in his notebook and about 3,000 of them were published in this book. It's called Compassion, Davis, California. And I began thinking about why that was significant to me and why that was inspirational to me uh, David also talks about who inspired him and how he had seen a TED talk by Karen Anderson and she had in 2008 received one of the TED prizes, $100,000 prize, to 
fulfill one of her um, inspira inspired visions, and that was to establish a charter for compassion that a number of other inspirational thinkers were a part of, a part of crafting. So we have this inspirational route on 3rd and C Street, grabbing my heart you know, more recently here and reminding me that about the same time this was happening, um, in uh, about 5,000, five, 6,000 miles away, here's this bench, first of all, that, that's been built on this corner just this last spring by a number of the people, a number of you here. Um, I think about 500 people were involved in, in uh, putting this together, the, the city of Davis, the Civic Art Council and others. Just as a, as a show of hands, um, how, ma how many of you were involved in putting this bench together? Could you raise your hand? Wait, wave it. All right. How, how many people were one of the 10,000 people that signed this, this, this notebook? Raise your hands. Keep your hands up. How many people have been to this corner on 3rd and Street, C Street, saw David standing there? Okay, there you go, and, 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 and have seen this bench. All right, that's a significant number of people here. We are talking about a root of inspiration that's, that's deep, that's growing, that's expanding, that's flowing, and connecting with you with us, together, right here. And so, with all this, I'm remembering that here we are in Davis, and at the same time this was happening five years ago, I'm having my own journey begin, my own roots of inspiration, about 6,000 miles away on the other side of the equator um, in the city of Santiago, Chile. I was asked to go down and teach a class for a week advanced project management, something really glamorous like that. And, uh, and so I show up and I was just out of my, out of my element, out of my comfort zone. And, you know, I thought it might have been, you know, the, everything was different. You know, the, the people, the place, I didn't know where I was, the currency. And so I, I sort of had to figure out how to get this all together. And then I thought, oh, well, it's because there's some really important people here in this room. Uh, heads of like the largest copper producing um, uh, company in the world right here and they were in this classroom along with personal friends and family members of the head of the firm that had brought me down to Santiago to talk so I don't know if I was nervous or what was going on regardless I, I somewhere somewhere in there I had to set that all aside and just do what I was there to do and somehow bring out of me whatever it was that I brought. And so I'm, I'm teaching this class, and, and as the week is progressing, I realize something very, very, very different is happening, something that's never happened to me before. And uh, you know, the, the people in the class were asking questions. I mean, I, I've had tough questions before, but these were intense, serious, pointed questions about problems they'd been experiencing with projects. And just, you know, projects, you know, start to finish, there's a budget and so forth. And, and yet, as they were asking these questions and I was having to come up with answers, I became uh, aware of m my own mantra that it's, it's printed in my uh, instructor bio that says, fail over projects hurt people. And I kept hearing this and feeling this. And what I began to experience was, it was something just incredibly visceral the pain that was coming out of these people as they were asking their questions, pain associated with issues and concerns they had over projects that have been in the past, projects they were in the middle of, projects that they were facing. And I began to realize that what I was talking about, maybe it wasn't so unglamorous after all, it, it was not about the mechanics of project management any longer it really began to be this pounding heart-to-heart -heart connection that was happening as we were talking about what the issues were and where they were going with all this. So, what, in short, what happened was I had a life-changing experience doing something in a completely different way than I've ever done before. And I, I had to ask myself, what happened and why? Probably more importantly, why? 
And as I began being really introspective, and that's not something that I, I do very well. You know, uh, honestly, I would really rather hang out with you guys than hang out with myself. <laughs> Just that's kind of the way I'm wired, right? So I'm spending a lot of time. Actually, it was a seven-year period. I'd already started this for two years before going down to Santiago. And I'm really just checking in with what's going on and why was this so different. And what I discovered that was that it was compassion. It was compassion. It was compassion that was motivating me and moving me to do something in a much, much different way than I've ever done. It was compassion that was creating this, this fresh perspective and set of actions that I'd never experienced, not that way. And, and then I really had to go, okay, uh, now I'm wanting to do things for people. I just like want to hug people and all these kinds of things. So, and, and sometimes that's, you know, kind of awkward. Yeah, especially in class, you know. I mean, this is a UC Davis class. We're all going to be serious here, but I really want to hug, you know. And, and it's not just the hugs. It was this, this, this intense awareness that what was happening was you and us and whatever it was we were talking about and whatever questions you have and how do we get to the, answer, to the answers of those questions. I was having this inspirational moment that says compassion is really what's driving everything. And, and I, I didn't need to figure out what to do with this. And what it led to was finding out what my purpose in life was, why I was even here. And that, that started to get kind of huge. I mean, like, I don't know if you want to think about that sometimes. You know, some of you probably already know what your purpose in life are. I know people that are I, I shouldn't say twice your age, some of you. Right? But closer to my age <laughs> that, <laughs> that don't know why they're here. Are you asking, wow, why are you here? What is your purpose? Uh, they're still trying to figure that out. There's a gentleman in this room today who is a, a friend and a mentor of mine who challenged me a year ago to state why I'm here. What is the purpose of my life? In 10 words or less, and write it down. Let's see if I can do this. Help people see how to fulfill their purpose here. Yeah, I got it, 10 words or less. And, and I'm going, that, that's your epiphany? That's what you're about? That's why you're here? I mean, that's pretty broad. But everything that I was doing, every time I was in front of a group of students, every time I was in a room answering questions, it was really about, wow, how, what is their purpose? How can I help them get there? And what, what do I do with this? And I realized that I needed to put together some tools that would help me be able to help people in any circumstance, wherever they were at, with questions they had, whether I knew anything about the topic or not. It was no longer about project management. It was about, you know, relationships. Ooh, that can get kind of messy, right? It was about work. It was about school. It was about life. It was about problems. It was about things that were happening that were hurting people, not just projects that were failing. So I realized that out of the inspiration, that it was compassion that was really driving me and finding out what my purpose for existence is and needing to put together a set of tools that, that I could just have right there to, to be able to be helpful to people on the spot. That the, uh, the tools started coming from all over the place, all kinds of tools. And I'm, I'd like to focus on just one today. Inspiration, compassion, purpose, practice, and the, t the tool I want to tell you about is a story to illustrate this. So it's about four in the morning. How do I know that? I get a phone call on my cell phone. I'm looking over. I can see green, yellow lights of the old-fashioned clock alarm, clock radio, anybody might still have one of those. And somewhere, that, that tells me where my phone is. For the phone, and I hear a voice, and she's crying, and I'm trying to figure out what's going on, and it turns out that a mom is driving around Davis looking for her teenage daughter 
who went out the night before. You know, the mom is working on her master's degree and doing homework and just kind of thinking, yeah, sure, go ahead. Not doing her usual. Yeah, have the parents call me and you know, say, you know, the kind of thing that we learn to do, that's the usual thing for some good reasons. None of that happens. She doesn't know who, where her child is. She's trying to remember who, who doesn't have a phone number, doesn't have an address, and gives me a call. I'm in Sacramento. I don't know, I'm not the subject matter expert here. I do not have any names, phone numbers, no knowledge. And I'm, I'm hearing this panic happen and, and just this breakdown into you know, sobs that now we're just wailing. Just, I'm going, I am going to help this person with their purpose in life, really? And uh, I'm, I'm just kind of waking up. I'm looking outside. It's, it's you know, the wind's blowing, and, and I, I hear her saying she's in her car. It's cold. It's dark. And I'm waking up now, realizing I need to do. What do I do? What do I do? And the first thing I say, <laughs> this is what comes out. First thing I said was, "So, what are you thankful for?" Really. Really? Yeah. 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 Really. What are you thankful for? Uh, really. Uh, that I could call you at four in the morning and you'll answer the phone. Good. Who's watching your little one? Oh, yeah. Uh, my, my, my friend Hope. I'm thankful for, now all of a sudden I'm hearing, I'm thankful for my friend Hope. Well, what else are you thankful for? And then after the third I'm thankful for, there was a shift that happened. When people can be grateful for at least three things, there's studies all over the place have shown this, there's a shift that occurs and all of a sudden now, this person is in a, in a different state and is trying to figure out what to do. And here's what happens. Here's this place where we're okay and kind of below that, see the negative numbers, they're, they're there for a reason. You know, it doesn't mean you blew your exam. You've got negative numbers happening in life too. There's sadness, a little bit lower than that. There's anger, there's fear. This person was in panic. And you know, these are good emotions, they're valuable emotions, but you know a nice place to be? Right here, above the line. And what happens is as soon as we move above this emotional line, clarity comes. We're in this pressure. The pressure is just causing us not to be able to know what to do. We move up this emotional line. One of the best ways of doing it is gratitude. Now all of a sudden this person is going, okay, I need to just go home and get some rest. Guess what's um, the next one above gratitude? All right, and then above that, you know, passion, that's, that's an okay word. Some people put joy, like, and I don't mean just like, oh, that's pretty, pretty happy. I mean like overjoyed, joy unspeakable, full of glory, that kind of joy. And, and some people call this uh, top area love. And I've heard people say that, you know, there's two possible reactions to things that can happen to us in life when situations arise. We'll either react in fear or we'll react in love. So what was happening here was we're moving a person above this emotional line, and I'm thinking about this definition of gratitude that I just heard the other day. The other day, it turns chaos into order and confusion to clarity. An author by the name of Melody Beatty. I was at a uh, uh, like a healing circle by one of the local persons here um, uh, who was hosting this, and they were talking about gratitude of all things a few days before I'm going to talk about it so I kind of picked up on this quote this is exactly what was happening but really what was going on was this person is in an anxious state moves through gratitude to get to that answer so gratitude is one of these tools now in 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 my toolbox and my 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 set of practices and I'm thinking how does this relate to TEDx UC Davis when we have a bunch of students who have a lot of questions in life that you need answers to like. Anybody relate to any of these? Okay, when you have questions and you're in an emotional state where you're not necessarily above the line, the pressure is going on, we need to do something to get resilient because resilience is how we deal with pressure and stress. Gratitude is one way that gets us there. So here you have gratitude getting you to resilience so that you can get your answer and all this came about 
because it was an insightful moment because of a root of inspiration that says compassion can drive things and get you to have tools. And right after you get your answer, you realize that this is all, this is, this is what my life is. The inspiration begets insight. Compassion is driving. Gratitude is just one tool. We start to get this sense of resilience to the pressures, and we know what to do next. We can get the answer to life's question. Now, it might not be what your purpose in life is that I helped you get to. Maybe I just helped you get to the next step of what the right thing is to do. You can take inspiration. You can get your own practices and be resilient and get the answers to your own questions and inspire yourself or someone else whether you have the question or whether it's someone else. So some of the other practices that happen to come along are uh, resonant breathing. There's a certain way you can breathe where your heart and your brain get connected together and you're fine. There's uh, anybody here via values and action character strengths. You can use those. These are some in my toolkit. Systems thinking, Peter Senge, the fifth discipline. Muscle testing, if you've never heard of it, you're in for a surprise. Moving meditation is what I call martial arts. Sometimes I just want the music really, really, really loud. Just go for it, and now I'm ready for my boss the next day. I have that resilience that I need. And then it reminds me once again of this author who says, gratitude is. What does it do? It turns what we have into enough and then more. And what I realize is, as we come back and we look at this bench, compassion is listening all the things that I experienced, the roots of inspiration, brings me right back to imagine, empathy. This is, what, this is what happened to me in Santiago five years ago. Imagine, understanding. And as I come walking around the bench, down at the little co corner, the smallest art piece of, here, of, of, this, of this bench that the community has put together says it all. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm grateful for your presence. I'm grateful for those who listened with your heart. I am grateful for your gratitude practice and your resilience. And then I'd like to leave you with one question. What do you have that's already inside you? And how are you going to be inspired to do something about it? Thank you, Joe. Um, I would like to say, if you've never actually been there before, that this bench is a very humbling place to be. Um, you can honestly sit down here, especially right before a farmer's market, watch all of Davis move right in front of you. And the second thing I wanted to say is, as awkward it is to try and hug the person next to you, it is a very heartwarming feeling. Now, I would like to move on and say that we had the um, ability to add a third performer to our ensemble today. I would like to introduce Tanya, our previous, or my secondary MC. Uh, she is the president of the Davis uh, Six Bits Spoken Word Collective, and she is going to grace us with her own improv. Please help me welcome Tanya to the stage. So as a brief introduction to my piece, just so you can vaguely understand why it inspires me. When I was 16, I had the opportunity to go on a month-long backpacking trip through my school, and I was terrified. You know, I, 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 I've been a swimmer my whole life. I was not prepared at all for the level of, of rigorous physical activity in this backpacking trip, but I went on it, and it was like the most fun I've ever had in my life. And so for, for months and years afterwards, I thought, you know, I figured out what I want to do with my life. Like, I want to be a wilderness guide. I want to take people out on these trips. And, um, and so the piece that I'm going to perform, I, I wrote when I was in that stage, when I was like, this, this is what I want to do. I figured it out. Um, and then around when I was 18, I started getting sick. Not like, like, like really, really, really sick, but like sick in the way that like it affected what I did and, and how I moved and how I interacted with people. And there was a certain point where I sort of had to realize, um, at least where I am right now, that's not a possibility for me. I, I can't be a wilderness guide. It's, 
you know, I can't take on that responsibility of taking care of other people when I need to take care of myself. And that was a really hard thing to accept, but I'm not at the point where I'm willing to completely push it off the table because I believe that if I keep working hard and if I keep trying, I can get better enough where I can get back to this place. And the way that I keep that thought in my mind is sometimes I'll run through this poem in my head and I'll think, you know, I've been there once before and I believe that I can get there again. And so this poem is very simply titled, Outside. I have established my place in the world, says the tree to the passing bird. He's hoping his words will be heard as an affirmation. Here I stand, here I be, this is what home means to me. But as neither bird nor tree, bit by bit I'm gaining clarity that my old concept of reality is contraception for being free, see. I could have easily slipped semi-queasily into a quiet life, squeezing me with a surprising lack of seasoning. Standard practices convening into conventionality. Pallidly passing the days as if awake in utero, I'm not moving, no, I'm squeezed in on all sides. Suffocated by the sense of being inside, I spy six planes and a set of stairs slowly sinking in my chair, watching bugs bumping against the ceiling, peeling off pieces of their antenna and attempt to circumvent the stents of this here heart home, like how my rhymes try to escape this poem. Because home is where the heart is, but I've bled mine dry outside, sides aching, back breaking beneath the 60 pound pack, cracking new grooves into the snow beneath my boots. This is truth, as tangible and real as your first loose tooth, and this is the way I want to spend my youth. Loose limbed and fast paced, craving arid, barren landscapes, new mind states indeed, a sort of geographical greed, cause I need desert streaming past the windows like the wind blows through my fingers, yet it lingers like dead bee stingers stuck under my skin, pinpointing like stars, leaving the most beautiful scars carved into me like stone, so I carry these memories wherever I roam. Like how there's tomes told in the cracked soles of my feet reminding me to keep certain realities out of my periphery and preferably more perpendicular to me. That's why when I bike I spread my arms like I'm flying, legs pumping like pistons, this one a drive by thigh five, I'm high knees beating my bones but slow going on a mountain bike, might crash and fall cause I can't ride my bike with no handlebars. And I can't handle bars, can't craft a linear rhyme because my lines defy structure. Flustered by edifices keeping me in, I want to spin buildings out of spider webs, stick my legs to stringy threads, then let them go. Move on to a new home. Because a moan is what this part is, and I've said mine under the sky. Amidst howls to the moon and melodies at noon and prayers to be primal to the day that I die. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. I, I would try that myself, but I'll spare you all the pain of me trying to do that up on stage right now. Now, before we go to intermission, I'd like to make a few announcements. Uh, raise your hand real quick if you've noticed a very colorful sticky note on your programs. Now, what we're gonna do for our, our interactive activity is you're gonna take that sticky note and write something that inspires you. Friend, family member, idea that you've heard today, just anything. Because in our lobby, we're gonna make our own tree of inspiration. And we want all of you to help contribute. So you're gonna take whatever inspires you, a person, anything, an idea, and you're gonna write it down and add it to that tree. Now the thing we want you to do with that though is after you write your idea, we want you to talk to other members in the audience, preferably people you didn't come with. We want you to talk to all the creative, artistic, and in in intellectual individuals in this audience right now. And we also encourage you to talk to the speakers. We encourage you to come up to them and talk to them about their ideas and what you felt about their ideas, what you thought, what inspired you about those ideas. Now, we will also have complimentary refreshments and everything else in the lobby. And so we have roughly about 15 minutes for our intermission. And uh, we will give you about a five minute warning to get back to your seats. Thank you.
All right, welcome back, everybody. Did everyone have a good intermission? Did everyone have a good intermission? Yeah. Oh my gosh, you guys are so great. All right, so uh, uh, raise the hands. How many of you met someone new out in the lobby today? Look at that. You see how many hands there are? We are achieving our goal. And how many of you learned something new about someone's inspiration today or took a look at the roots? Excellent. I love the way that it looks out there. My favorite sticky note that I saw on the tree or roots of inspiration, it just said, wow, women on bikes. Yay! I was like, that speaks to me. <laughs> was that yours? That's great. I like that one. It inspires me too. Um, and so remember though that, you know, this doesn't stop with the sticky notes on the tree or the intermission or whatever. You can continue all these dialogues outside of the salon, in the lobby, or in the rest of the world. So we highly encourage you to keep talking to others and to yourselves about what inspires you. Um, but for now, what we have coming up is our next speaker. Pam Marone, or Dr. Pam Marone. And so, as you can see, she has a very impressive biography on our flyer, but one thing that isn't put on there, which is a little fun fact I found out about her, is um, she is an entomologist. And for those of you who don't know what an entomologist is, it's pretty much somebody that studies bugs and thinks bugs are cool. Yes, people do think bugs are cool. So I always ask people when I find out if they do entomology, if they also practice entophagy, which is the practice of eating bugs. And she automatically says, yes, Yes, it's a great source of protein. She says, you can tell everyone that I have a copy of the book Eating Insects on my bookshelf back home. But thankfully, she takes pity on her friends and family, and she doesn't make them participate as well in the practice. So I would like you all to help me in welcoming Dr. Pam Rohn up to the stage. There's a conversation going on. Actually, it's more of a debate. With the world population going from 7 billion to, to 9 billion by 2050, how are we going to feed all these people? Many will say we still have to have chemical pesticides. Others will say we have to have genetically modified crops. Well, we all can agree that we have to feed the world more sustainably and do it more sustainably than we have in the past. What I'm here to say is that there's an alternate technology, biological crop protection or natural products that can help solve all of these problems and do it more sustainably. And that's what I'm here to tell you about today. I grew up in a little town in Killingworth, Connecticut on 30-something acres. I spent my childhood with a kitchen strainer at the pond, identifying the dragonfly nymphs and other insects that lived there. And I helped my parents with their very large half-acre garden and their vegetable garden and their raspberries and their blueberries and their Christmas tree plantation. But the most important watershed event was when the gypsy moths invaded the town and most of Connecticut and stripped the trees bare. And they did this about every five to seven years. And so I was standing out in the woods, and the droppings from the caterpillars were coming down like rain. If you're an entomologist, you know the droppings are called frass. So that frass would come down on my head, and I'd look around, and I'd see it's like the middle of winter and summer because these caterpillars had denuded the forest. Well, there was a dogwood tree right outside the kitchen window, and this is a shot I took just a, a little while ago. It's gotten a lot bigger, still, still outside the kitchen window. And my dad was worried that this beautiful tree was going to get harmed and denuded by the caterpillars. So he trots off to the, to the store, and uh, the hardware store, and he brings back a product to kill the, the pest, to kill the caterpillars. So he sprays it on the tree. All the caterpillars drop to the ground, and my mother comes out, and she's freaking out, and she says, Pamela, come look, come look. And she looks on the ground, and she makes me look, and the lady beetles, the honeybees, the lacewings, the beneficial insects were all dead along with the caterpillars. And what we found out was actually that product that he used was quite toxic to all of those organisms, but also to himself. So my mother wagged her finger at him and said, you will not use that again. And he, like most husbands do, dutifully obey their wives. And he went back to the, to the store and said, what have you got that's safer? Believe it or not, there was a product. And this is, gosh, 50 years ago 
was Bacillus thuringiensis, a common soil bacterium, still in use today, the first ever biological product for pest control that kills caterpillars, and he sprayed it instead of the chemical. So I went out there and I said, Dad, what do you think? And he goes, I don't know if it worked, but it's safe for the environment. That is the story of my career. <laughs> Developing products that are safer, but people don't necessarily think they work. But the products that we're developing today in the labs here in Davis, they sure do work, and they are environmentally responsible. So how do you do this? Well, um, I'll tell you the process for how we get from discovery to a product. But first I want to define, whoops, first um, define what they actually are. So what we're talking about are naturally occurring bacteria, fungi, molds, and insect-specific viruses, and also natural substances like extracts of plants that have non-toxic modes of action, fatty acids, and other things like that. And they're regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency. There's been a 65-year history of use, and there's never been an environmental or safety incident with these types of products. So we have a long history, and they're well-regulated. So where do you look for these? Well, I could give you a little baggie and send you out on an expedition. and. Uh, and you could bring back me some soil or some compost or things. And, you, and there might be something in here that could be turned into a product. But uh, as my husband knows, I'm an expert at this, having uh, groups in my, in my career screening, testing over 100,000 microorganisms. So when I'm on vacation uh, with my dear husband, who's here, of 36 and a half years and our dogs, I will go, and I'll be walking, I'll go, oh, 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 oh my god, I've got it. And I'll have my baggies always in my pocket, and I'll collect a sample. And yeah, we know entomologists are weird, you know that. Um, and I'll collect a sample, and I'll bring the sample back to the laboratory. And there's some of the places that you can look. Just like most of your human drugs, more than 50%, have been found from natural sources, your antibiotics, penicillin comes from a mold. Um, the same thing, we can look to nature for looking for leaves and flowers and composts and soils and find the microorganisms that lives there and turn them into products. So the next step in the pro process is actually bring, isolating them onto petri plates. So we have um, some amazing types of bacteria that can be found in nature, all different colors and types. But our microbiologists will bring these samples back to the laboratory, and then they will isolate them on the petri plates and individually pick out the colonies they think are interesting. Now over time, it's not a ran it's a, it might be a more random process in the beginning, but over time they become expert pickers, and they can pick off the, the, the ones that they think are quite interesting and they haven't seen before, might be, might be just not any ordinary thing, and then they um, individually put them on the plates, and then we grow them in liquid, in little test tubes in liquid fermentation, and then we test them. So we then test them against a whole range of pests and weeds, in the laboratory to see if any of these microbes and their extracts from the microbes will kill uh, and become a natural pest control. So we test a, a wide range of insects, nematodes, which are roundworms that feed on the plants, weeds, algae, and so forth. Now, this is heavy chemistry for some of you, I'm sure. But just like I said, remember penicillin comes from a mold? Same thing here is that the compounds, the chemistry produced by these naturally occurring bacteria and molds, this, these can be pesticidal. And here are some of the structures that we found in our lab that have pesticidal activity. So that microbe that we find from that soil sample produces these compounds as it's growing and in fermentation when we grow it, and this is what's causing the pest to die. So then you have to turn it into a product. Okay, so what, you know, what, what's the next step? Well, you have to formulate it in a way that a farmer can use. So it has to be able to not wash off instantly when it rains. It ha can't clog nozzles. It has to spray nicely and stick to, the, to the, uh, the crop. So that's called formulation. So the formulation chemists, which we have, will uh, find ways and preservatives, and in our case, our products are organically listed. So they would only have certainly organically allowed preservatives in there to be able to have the product um, withstand uh, being able to be moved around, put in the warehouse, and withstand all the rigors like chemical pesticides. So that's what formulation chemistry does. And then you have the chemical engineers and the microbiologists who have to grow the microbe in fermentation, just like you're making wine and beer, but a much faster process, because these microbes can grow 
um, and come to their peak growth in 36, 48, 72 hours. So you put them in a fermenter, and there's a picture of a fermenter in our lab here, and they multiply themselves, and in, in their growth, they're producing these pesticidal compounds. And the chemical engineers and microbiologists will find the recipe, just like you're cooking, and actually some of the best scientists are really good cooks of these microbes. They have a flair for it, just like some of you can cook and others can't. And they um, will find the right food for the microbe, the right oxygen, the right temperature, so that it can maximize their growth in the fermentation tank. Um, then uh, we have to get some and put it out in the field in real world situations, not just the lab, and spray it out on the crops and find out how it kills and what, it's, what kind of pests and the spectrum of pests it's killing. And then we have to make sure that it's safe. Just because it's natural doesn't mean that it's safe. You know that. You know that. So we have to prove that it's safe. So we have to do a number of tests on rats and mice and birds and fish and lacewings and lady beetles and parasitic wasps and honeybees to prove that there are no toxic effects. So these are well regulated and we prove that. And then you submit the package to the Environmental Protection Agency in California Department of Pesticide Regulation and they'll approve it for sale. But then you have to grow, you know, this is all nice, well and you know, nice in the lab, but you actually have to grow it in commercial production for large scale. So going from a one liter fermenter in the lab to 10 liters, then to 100 liters, then to 20,000 liters like we have in our factory in Bangor, Michigan, 20,000 liters being about 5,000 gallons, about three, uh, two to three stories high, that's the size of fermenter that we need for commercial production. And uh, so we grow them in these big tanks and then you harvest them. So again, after 24, 48, uh, 72 hours, you harvest the microbe, it multiplies itself, and then you, if the microbe is not stable in a liquid form, and sometimes the, the compounds that they have are so biodegradable that they need to be dried and they're not stable in the liquid, so you um, spray them, just spray dry them like you're making powdered milk, so in a big dryer, and that would be the, what the end product looks like. Or if the compounds um, and the microbe is stable in liquid, you can put them in a, in a liquid form, so they could be packaged for the farmer in a jug like this, a two gallon jug, or if it's the dry formulation to be packaged in a, in a bag like this. So that's the end of the process. So let me give you some examples of some of these things. So this is a product we commercialize called Grandivo. It's a new species of bacterium, new to nature, first discovered by a scientist at the U.S. Department of Agriculture from under a hemlock tree in Maryland. And they named it Chromobacterium subsugi, subsugi meaning under hemlock. And what this is a remarkable microorganism. It produces purple pigments, and some of these pigments and other compounds that we discovered is birth control for bugs. The bugs stop reproducing. It also um, makes them stop feeding in a few seconds and they throw up and die. The picture of a leaf beetle um, actually leaking out of both ends. Pretty gross, huh? Um, but you know, I'm an entomologist, I tell you, I get into this stuff. And so it also repels the, the insects from the leaves. So this is, um, this is a new mode of action. So it doesn't work like chemical pesticides. Chemical pesticides, typically the farmers will spray it and they'll see the bugs drop off in 24 hours. Well, this is because it has this unusual mode of action of this repellency and this reproductive effects and the anti-feeding, it requires some education for the farmers to use it. But once it's integrated into a program, it's a great tool. We've discovered in our lab from a, a garden soil, a bacterium that is actually a weed killer. And it kills pigweeds, like in this picture. You can put one drop of the bacteria onto a leaf and it will completely stunt the plant compared to the untreated on the right. So it's got a remarkable ability to produce some compounds that move in the weed up and it's called systemic activity to kill the weed and we're developing this. Now here's an example of some bacteria that don't actually kill anything but actually enhance the crop. And so we found two different bacteria and one of them actually helps the plant live in soils that are very salty. So when there's ex lots of fertilizer used in agriculture, the soil becomes very salty, lots of salt, and the plants don't, can't grow very well, and they become really weak. And so you have some examples where we could put the bacteria in the soil, and the plants will grow remarkably and be green and healthy, but without the bacteria, they look pretty wim wimpy. Then we have another uh, bacteria we discovered where you can stop watering, and in times of drought, 
the plant will live, and this is a picture from our laboratory where very little water was given to the tomatoes for six weeks. On the left is what happens to the drought-stricken plants, and on the right are the ones with the bacteria in the soil. So these bacteria are remarkable in be ab being able to enhance the, the growth of plants. And sometimes they do this by living inside of the plant. And on the top, showing the fluorescent uh, green, that is a corn root. And that shows that the bacteria have actually gone inside the root. It's called an endophyte. And by living inside the root, whatever it's doing in there, it's helping it, it overcome this drought and salt stress. Now the final example I'll give you is a bacteria that kills invasive zebra and quagga mussels. These invasive mollusks, mollusks came into the United States in ballast water many years ago in ships and then invaded the Great Lakes and are now spreading, well they've spread into Canada, they're spreading across Western Europe where, where they originally came from Eastern Europe and spreading across Western Europe and they're spreading down, they just found in Baja, Mexico and spreading west, we have some various um, invasions out here in the west and if you're a boater or a fisherman you'll know that you get, have to have your boat inspected for these mussels because we don't want them to spread because they cause major ecological disaster when they spread into freshwater ecosystems. They can destroy native mussels and they're even invading, look at there, they're, they're living on other organisms here and they um, grow so fast they uh, destroy the, the lakes and also they clog up pipes so power plants, industrial and power plants, have to use very toxic compounds, lots of chlorine and quaternary ammonium compounds to get rid of these mussels on the plants. So some years ago, some scientists in a little lab in upstate New York, of New York State Museum, went looking for a solution to this mussel because the electric utilities in upstate New York were having problems with these mussels in their power plants. So they got some water samples and some soil samples and uh, by the, by the mussel infested river and found, screened, se tested several thousand bacteria and found one bacterium, Pseudomonas fluorescens strain CL45A, that when fed to the mussels kills these mussels and only kills these mussels, a remarkable discovery because it doesn't kill anything else but these two species of mus mussels. So we have commercialized this product into what's called Zequinox and uh, we're, we got approval, we had pipe approval to treat pipes and this year we got approval to actually treat lakes and have very successfully been able to uh, reduce some of the populations around the edges of some lakes in Minnesota and that will, when we'll be expanding that usage. So those are some very remarkable examples of what naturally occurring microorganisms can do for pest management. So here we are back to feeding the world again and my live stream has been to, to develop these, discover these, develop these and find ways to integrate these into crop production and pest management programs. Biologicals, the bugs don't develop resistance very easily to them, so you can use them and not have to worry that the bugs are gonna become immune to them. If you're a Napa Valley uh, farm vineyard manager and you wanna spray in the morning and get back in the field in the afternoon, you can do that with these products because they are, have that level of safety. If you're a consumer or an exporter worried about the chemical residues on your produce at time of harvest, and the residues, the amount of chemical, is very highly regulated, and a lot of consumers don't want the pesticides on their food at time when they eat, you know, when they eat it, you can spray our products right up to harvest and it doesn't leave any chemical residues. So here are some of the advantages of why uh, you know, we're so bullish on these types of products. So I've worked my entire career to try to transform agriculture from its current state where it's chemical intensive. So farmers use primarily chemical pesticides and they dial in biologicals when they can't use chemicals or the chemicals have been restricted. There's also a consumer demand for organic production, which is conti will continue to grow. There's more organic demand than there is supply. But the green is where, where we're really going to over the next 10 to 20 years is that my dream is you will have biologicals be the base of the program and you only dial in chemicals when needed. So you all eat, of course. <laughs> of course, you have to eat food and health are inextricably linked together. So all of you should care about where your food is coming from and how it is farmed. So please join the conversation and the debate. Thank you.
thank you so much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I like that slide. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. Um, my favorite part about it is, you know, here in Davis especially, we're always hearing about um, big corporations and, you know, their killer pesticides and all the horrible products that are being put into our soil and into our water. And it's just so nice to hear that there's an alternative eco-friendly replacement for this, balancing everything out. And it's also super nice because now I know what to get my mom for Christmas. Um, so next up, our next speaker that we have is going to be Kathy Speck, and some of you might be familiar with the name, not only because of the flyer, but someone actually put Kathy down as one of their inspirations on a sticky note on the Tree of Inspiration. And uh, I'm vaguely familiar with the sound of Kathy because at the beginning of this event, if any of you heard that little horn going off in the corner, that was Kathy's on her walker. And if you get the chance to look at it up close, it is the best decorated walker that I have ever seen. Multiple noise makers and a significant amount of little plushy toy animals. And I know that what she has to tell us today is even more beautiful and exciting than the way that she's decorated her walker. So I would love if you would all help me in welcoming Kathy up to the stage. Oh, and, and one other thing, one of the toys that she has, um, you can actually see it from here. There's a My Little Pony hanging from the side, and Kathy was telling me that she absolutely hates My Little Pony. Does not like My Little Pony at all. So why is it on there? And she gave me this great story, you know, her entire life turned upside down at one point, and she just saw this My Little Pony toy, and she said, you know what, I'm gonna turn this thing on its head. And she took something that she didn't like, and she attached it to her walker, and it's just grown and grown from there. Can any of you shout out anything that you can identify in the walker from the audience? There it is. I do, except when I'm taking a shower, I get rid of the cape because it just makes, you know, washing my hair so difficult. So <laughs> I'll take, in fact, I'll take this off now so I don't fidget with it. I fidget. Some of you heard the horn. Here it is. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you, Linda. Linda happens to be the most talented musician I've ever met. Thank you. All right. Let's try that. Nope. Hey, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? Blue sky. Yeah. So I, I was actually raised right here in Davis, California. I wasn't born here. Actually, I was born in the theater. Uh, my, my parents were here, and my mom said, oh, put away the popcorn. My water broke. No, just kidding. <laughs> I want to thank all of the people that helped make this happen. I know it's a ton of work, and thank, thank all of you as well supporting something like this in our community and having UC Davis and the community of Davis come together to make something just like this. But enough about you, let's talk about me. That's why you paid the big bucks, right? <laughs> big bucks, okay. Uh, as some of you might know, I have ALS, 
a myotrophic lateral sclerosis. How many of you out there uh, heard about the ice bucket challenge and ALS? Yes, yes. And I know that many of you did the ice bucket challenge and I was there with some of you. And not only did you pour freezing cold water over your head, but you also made generous donations. Thank you very much for that. Um, what is ALS? Well, it's cruel, it's devastating, it's ugly. And I don't mean that people are ugly. I said this once to people, oh, people aren't ugly if they have ALS. No, the disease is ugly and cruel and devastating. What it is basically is you have the motor neurons. They're the ones that go to your voluntary muscles. For some reason, they don't know why, but the motor neurons die before they get to the muscle. And it's like, like I said, all the voluntary muscles including your tongue. Some people with ALS, they get, it's called the bulbar region, and it starts there, their muscles of the tongue and swallowing and that sort of thing. Other people, it starts with limb, limb onset. To get the feeling of what it would be like if you had ALS and you had the bulbar on onset, try not moving your tongue at all and say your name out loud. Go ahead, try that. Don't move your tongue. And that's what it's like. And it's horrible for the person who's trying to communicate because you can look at the people, they don't, they don't know what you're saying, they don't know what you're thinking. And then on the other side, if you're the one who is, you, you don't understand, you don't know what they need. Now sometimes, Sometimes you can use different devices, like if you can still use your fingers, you can type stuff and your voice, or not your voice, another person's voice. Like I would, you, you can have a, a, like an American woman or a British woman, an American man or a British man, and I was gonna get one of those, and of course I was gonna pick the British man. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's a, Neuro to fatal terminal neurodegenerative disease. And if you go through the whole process, like my mom did, you end up in a, in a situation that's called the glass coffin because you can't move anything. You can hear and you can think, but you have no way of reacting to anyone else. They can't, they don't even know. You just are trapped in your own body. Now I mentioned my mom. Normally ALS is sporadic. It can get anyone at any time, anywhere. And it used to be that ALS affected people between the ages of 40 and 70. But as ALS is getting more known and there's more research, and people are coming out of the closet that they have ALS because it's so ugly. Most people hide it. They don't come out. But what's happening now that more people are talking about it is we're finding out, oh no, it's happening to people who are 26. It's happening to people who are 80. And we got what they found in 1993 which is really the only one thing that's happened since the 1860s when it was discovered, is they found a genetic mutation that leads to ALS. But it's very, very rare. It happens to be in my family. And our particular case has not been seen anywhere else. And I just realized that I skipped one of the best parts of the slideshow, so we're gonna get a little bit silly here, if you don't mind. Oh, no. Super, thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, there it is. <laughs> okay, that was, I was gonna say, like the first thing you need to know about me is that I'm hilarious. 
Okay, and you're laughing at all the appropriate times, so that's great. And I, <laughs> that was long before ALS. I just kind of liked getting down and dirty in cemeteries whenever we ran across one. Oh, look, there's a cemetery. Can we stop? Um, yes. Oh, darn it. Oh, that one? Okay. So I was telling you that this very rare, very rare, less than 2% of all ALS cases are genetic mutation, like my family's. This is my brother Larry, and his, his hound's Chuck and Daisy. And uh, I'm over there in the corner. Larry had been diagnosed with ALS on May 6, 2008, and he died June 11, 2008. He had been misdiagnosed so many times. And I, I had seen it in him before. I could tell it was coming. In this shot, I was helping him go through papers, uh, the kind of stuff that you need to do when you know you're dying fairly soon. And this picture was taken two weeks before he died. Oops. My mom and my dad. Thanksgiving. I, I look at those two and the turkey, and they're so happy together, and they're so proud, and it's like they gave birth to this little baby turkey. <laughs> and it came out roasted perfectly. <laughs> my mom was my world. I adored her. I always wanted to be sitting next to her where our arms could touch. I was a mama's girl. She was diagnosed with ALS when I was 11. And nobody had heard of ALS back then, Lou Gehrig's disease, but that doesn't really mean anything to anybody. First we just noticed some kind of weird twitches, and I, I particularly noticed it because my arm was always trying to touch hers, and I would look at these things happening in her skin. I said, Mom, what is that? What's it, what's it doing? Well, it got worse, and then her elbow wasn't working right, and then her right thumb and her right shoulder. And it got worse and worse and worse. My, my parents had, when, when they finally came up with the diagnosis, which I wasn't going to believe because I knew my mom could outdo anything, she could do that. There was nothing that was going to beat her. But uh, I am the second youngest of nine children. When they made the diagnosis, we were sitting at our very long table, mom sitting here, dad sitting there, I'm sitting right next to mom, and dad opened up this light blue little trifold pamphlet. He said, your mother has this disease. And he continued to read it and read it and read it. And it's all about, well, most people die within two to five years. There's no cure. There's really, we don't know the cause. And da 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 da. And I listened, but not really, till the very end when it said, ALS is not hereditary, but it can run in families. What does that mean? You know, what does that mean? Now, we knew that her aunt had died of Lou Gehrig's disease back then, but we didn't, we didn't know a whole lot about that. A mom got sicker and sicker, and I still did not believe that she was going to die. I knew that she was going to pull through. I had to deal with God about it. Well, In 2000, 2000, 1972, she had gotten worse and worse, and we weren't able to take care of her at home anymore. So she went into, um, back then was the community 
Davis Community Hospital, and she stayed there where they would keep her from choking, um, from choking to death or aspirating. Uh, it was just more than we could do at home anywhere. But she got to come home for, for special occasions. And one of those occasions was Thanksgiving. She, by then, she couldn't use either of her arms. And she, was, she was able to speak, and she was able to swallow, and uh, no problems of cognitive impairment or anything like that. So, and it also happened to be that uh, my, my birthday is always right around Thanksgiving. And so I felt extra special because she got to come home from the hospital to be there for my birthday as well. So we, we took all the Thanksgiving fixings and put it in a blender. And then she had her cup here and her straw. And she sucked her Thanksgiving dinner through the straw. I still didn't believe she was going to die. I didn't. It was getting close to Christmas time. We loved Christmas. My mom loved Christmas. And boy, we, we looked like a Christmas store. And it was, it was just it was really meaningful to me. And so I had this deal with God that she was going to come home on Christmas Eve, and in the morning she would be healed. And that was a deal, and the deal that I was going to give to God. I said, you know, you give me my mom, I'll give you all my Christmas presents. That makes sense to me. Well, December 18th, I was outside, it was raining, and I was outside playing basketball because that's what I did. And um, my brother Jim opens the front door and said, Kathy, mom's in a coma. And I said, okay. And I just kept shooting basketballs because I knew I had this all figured out, right? The coma wasn't really a coma. She was saving energy so that when she came home, she could be healed, so she was just saving energy. December 19th, 3 in the morning. Phone rings. My dad and mom's bedroom was right next to my bedroom. And I hear dad talking to the hospital. And I hear him say, did she suffer? And then he hung up and proceeded to call all the relatives and the good friends, and I listened over and over and over again as he called people. And then he came into my room, and he sat on the edge of my bed and said, Mommy died. I said, I know. And I cried myself to sleep. The next morning I woke up and I could hear all these people were in the family room and you got to organize all this stuff for the funeral and the reception and I, I could hear it and was, I had been thinking maybe this was just a bad dream. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm awake now and mom is still alive. But as I started to come from the hallway all the way to the family room and I could hear what people were talking about, it was, oh, she did die. And I walked very slowly. And I said, what do I do now? What do I do now? I was empty. I was hollow. I just, I had no idea what to do. So, I'd, my coping skills, some of them were good, some of them were not. I, uh, I got way, way, way involved with uh, sports or club activities. I got straight A's. I did everything because I had this vision of my mom sitting on a cloud watching me, and I wanted her to be proud of me. So I did great. I did great. And then I went away to college, and I had to leave Davis to go to college because I had to come out. I knew I was gay, 
and this is in the late 70s, and it wasn't cool to be gay like it is now. I was way ahead of the curve, right? <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> so I came out and had a lot of fun. I was a basketball player, and um, basketball had been my saving grace. And then my knees went, and I couldn't play. And then everything fell apart. All the, the, the basketball and all that kind of stuff that kept me going, it wasn't there, and I was starting to feel that emptiness again, that devastation. At that point, my coping skills went down the toilet, literally. I became uh, an alcoholic, bulimic, anorexic, I hurt myself. I didn't do a lot of cutting. I did like burns, bruises, like getting bruises was really made me feel any, I, I know, I know that some of you out there are cutters and I'm gonna say your name out loud right now. <laughs> you can say, hi, I'm Kathy and I'm a cutter. Um, and I moved back to Davis because I knew, I knew I had to come back to Davis to heal, and I figured it that it would out. It would take about a year <laughs> to fast track one. And, you know, the online. No, it wasn't online back then. So, yeah, I need, needed a year to heal. Well, no, um, and I got lower and lower and lower until I was so ashamed and humiliated because people had expectations from Kathy Speck. She was going to go far. And I ended up uh, in college studying self-destruction with a minor in suicidal thoughts. Only I flunked out of that, so whatever. I'm still alive. Um, let's see, where are we here? Oh, darn it all. Well, there's mom and dad. Mom and dad in the other pictures. My mom was able to see uh, her oldest daughter, my, my sister. Barb, she got to see Barb get married, and that was very important to her. And I remember overhearing her talk to my dad because she couldn't use her right arm by then. It just hung there. And she didn't want people to feel uncomfortable with makeup. You know, you, you do the receiving line where you go up and you shake somebody's hand and say, blah, blah, blah. But she couldn't use her right arm, and she was afraid if she leaned over with her left arm that that would make people uncomfortable. So. Uh, I had been listening to her and, and, and things um, that it was real. Now I've kind of gone all over and got back and forth just because, silly. Oh, now this is what I want, this is, this is the picture. This is where it all comes together. This is on our, uh, on the side yard. I grew up on Oak Avenue, 903 Oak Avenue great place to live. And I think on our block, what, we had 14 lesbians? Is that right? It's not my fault. <laughs> well, maybe a few. Um, so this is, this is my family and my brother, my brother Paul, who's on the end, and my brother Larry, who's on the end, they, both of them died of ALS, Paul in 2011, Larry in 2008, and my mom died in 1972. My sister Susan, who's wearing a green sweatshirt, she died on Valentine's Day, 1997, and then Grandma Mabel, the only grandparent I ever knew, died on, on the 4th of July, 1974. And I guess the rest of us are still alive. Um, I'm doing great. Uh, I'm, I, um, I'm doing great with my ALS. I really am. And this community is a huge part of it. Absolutely. I feel so supported. And one of the things that's also keeping me alive longer is that I've chosen to use oxygen uh, daily, but also at night I wear this thing. It's kind of like respiratory therapy. 
and that has been proven to extend life possibly up to five years more. So that has a lot to do with why I'm still alive and doing so well, but other than that, it is the community to support. My friends who are here, thank you, I love you. And the whole community, it, how can I not how can I not be happy? I know that sounds weird, but I'm, I'm at the most peace. And, um, and I gotta go fast, right, too? Yikes, I have two minutes? Shoot, okay, darn. Uh, <laughs> all right, so this is what we could do. I could sing a song, I could show you a 40 second video of me skydiving, um, and say a few more words. Song? Okay. Okay. So what happened is this is a song that I wrote about uh, 10 years after my mom died. And I wrote the lyrics. Uh, the music is from uh, Paul Robbins and Linda Duval, the very, very talented musician who was also my very kind and supportive caregiver. I also wouldn't be doing so well if it, if it were not for her helping me. So I wrote this song imagining if my mom could sit on the edge of my bed and tell me things were gonna be all right. That was my song for my mom comforting me and now this song is for you. And after I die, you can imagine me sitting on the side of your bed or you can kick me off on the floor. Um, <laughs> And sitting there and just telling you, it's going to be OK. Now, initially, we were going to have me sing along to my CD. Uh, that's the other thing I forgot to tell you. Um, because of ALS, I can't sing anymore. I was a singer, performer, uh, all that kind of stuff. But the ALS has taken that from me. However, I am going to do this today is I'm going to sing with actually all I'm going to have is the the sound from the laptop which is not at all loud so what you're going to hear is me trusting you because I'm going to sing and I've, I have not done this um, it's called sweet beyond and what do I need to do here just So this is a healing song. And I'm going to be here, okay. And I just talked so long that we missed, oh, geez. Oh. I like to do shows. <laughs> and I, I know these guys work so hard. I know that all these guys work so hard doing all the technical stuff that I can't do. And, <laughs> and then I just turned out talking most of the time, so chatty Cathy I am. Okay, so uh, I'm trusting you. I haven't done this, and here we go. No more left of me than favorite photographs and memories. I will greet the pale blue dawn and rest my soul in the sweet beyond. Please don't cry for my body please don't weep for my pain just let your heart feel I'll always love you I'll send you peace when you call my name just let your heart feel I'll always love you as I rest my soul 
in the sweet beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kathy, I got chills. You are still a very beautiful singer. Thank you very much. I really can't think of any better words to say for that other than inspiring. So one more round of applause for Kathy, please. And so since we are running a little short on time, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to cut with all of my speedy little introductions. So for now, if you would join me in welcoming our performer, Ann Cap Cap, to the stage. Oh. Wipe my tears, I'm sorry. That was beautiful. Wasn't that beautiful? That was beautiful. Yeah. I don't know how I can top that, but that was, that was very inspiring. Very inspiring. Um, before I start my piece, I'd just like to say hi. My name's Ann Cap Cap. Um, our, our theme today is Roots of Inspiration, and I think you guys really saw that with Miss Kathy Speck. One of those roots of inspiration comes from self. Um, something that I learned from my travels, from being a spoken word poet, going all the way across the country, all the way through California. Um, a lot of that inspiration comes from self, from believing that you can. So this piece comes from that part of me. And after all the tears, I hope you guys laugh a little with this. So please enjoy. You, the cool kid right there. You, with the hype trend and the gelled hair. The one who YOLOs, who flirts as sweet as a ho-ho, who says school is a no-go, killing his mojo like a black belt in the dojo. Your elbows are up. You're leaning like a cholo. You. The cool kid. You see, this poem is not for you. This is an era where a new kind of beautiful is rising up like the depths of America. This poem is for the losers, the geeks on League of Legend, the people who find beauty in RPG, the poetry writers, the peace fighters, the tacos who took too long to find their way back to reality because the world took up too much sanity, the underdogs and the soon to be. Steve Jobs of the 21st century. This is for the acne attack boys who couldn't get the girl. This is for the boys in the friend zone and the girls who can't afford a wink from the quarterbacks in the end zone. This is for mama's boys, Miss Independence. Maybe it's Maybelline commercial. Skip to watch the end credits of Star Wars, the Clone Wars. This is the new kind of sexy. I mean, I would know, I'm one of them. <laughs> y'all laugh, but y'all can't handle my five foot one Filipino fantasy. That's right, y'all can't handle what's cooking up in my kitchen. The kitchen stirring up some sweet honor roll GPA and AP class swag. That's right, y'all can't take in. <laughs> the curves of my perfectly coordinated honors pre-cow born parabola. That's right, y'all cannot take in. 
the supremely sexy list of extracurricular activities, including marching band, theater assets, broadcast journalism, and did I mention speech and debate? This incredibly attractive nerd from the 916 calls to her homies in the basement who are having their fifth juice box because mom won't let them drink soda. This band geek calls to her homie band geek to get turned on every time the tuba player plays in a perfect B flat pitch. I'm talking to the crew who don't need no relationship as long as they got access to the internet. I'm talking to you who have been dissed will be dissed or are being dissed for who you want to be despite the cruel standards of human society. If any of the spoken applies to you, my sweet brothers and sisters of this underground society, I'm asking you to rise up because the force is strong in you and that I come in peace. Thank you so much, Anne. And I hope y'all got the chance to check out her bio because she's in high school. <laughs> that is quite an accomplishment for a high school student. So next up, we have our final performers who, as you can see, are in the front right now setting up. We, oh, fun fact, they make their own drums. We are having Bakuhatsu Taiko Den, so please join me in welcoming them to the stage. How many of you out there in the audience have ever heard Taiko Don drumming before? Raise your hand, make some noise. Nice, keep them up, keep them up. How many of you have seen this group specifically perform before? Hand, hand. nice, we got some supporters. They are a club at UC Davis that has been performing for years, and this is my first time seeing them perform, so I am excited. Who else out there is excited? Nice, I hope y'all are ready, they get loud.
Thank you all so much. That was incredible, and that was a great end to an amazing event. Thank you all so much for coming. A round of applause for yourselves and our speakers and all of our lovely student volunteers. We couldn't have done this without all of you. And if you were inspired or if you enjoyed anything that you've seen today, please stay updated with TEDx UC Davis on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And you can get more information about our next salon that we're having in January. For now, we only have about 10 minutes left before we're getting kicked out of here. So I encourage you, I still encourage you all to talk to each other and take refreshments and mingle. But if you could do so while picking up trash and making sure the area is clean and slowly moving your way towards the exits in the back, we would highly appreciate it. Check out the tree, take some pictures. You can tweet or Instagram, hashtag it, hashtag TEDxUC Davis. Thank you so much to the Davis Downtown Business Association and all of our other sponsors. And thank you all so much. Hopefully, we'll see you in January.